Okay, so the title of my lesson is called Aliens Attack, and basically, um, just to kind of hint at some of the things I was thinking about, I, I started off with kind of an idea of what I wanted to do with my students, and I really wanted to tie in with something that NASA was already doing, so kind of the engineering aspects of problem solving, and so Kind of the impetus of this whole thing is, you know, we want to go to Mars, there's suspicion that there may be life on Mars, even if only microbes, uh, and yet there is that overriding concern of what happens if we get over there and we bring something back and it wipes out all, everybody on our planet. Or what happens if there is some beneficial microbe sitting on Mars right now that's the cure for cancer, and we go over there and we kill it. So I know that one of the things that NASA must be looking at right now is xenobiology. How does the biology of something that is not on planet Earth, how does it function with regard to its own unique environment? And how can we then use that as a problem for our kids to solve? You're a NASA engineer. You're, you're an astrobiologist. How do you solve this problem? How do we ensure that what we're sending over there is not going to harm their natural environment or their organismal life? How do we ensure that whatever we bring back also doesn't harm our delicate ecosystems. So when you think about aliens, because really that's what they are, uh, oftentimes, you know, uh, I, I like, you know, Futurama, and so of course I thought about that example. And then, uh, not so recently, but a really cool movie in my opinion as far as, you know, sci-fi types of, uh, of uh, graphics and whatnot, uh, War of the Worlds. Old, old story retold recently. Not done very well. I'm sorry. I don't think Tom Cruise did a very good job of acting, but the special effects were phenomenal. The special effects were phenomenal, and the basic concept was, in fact, safe. Um, what we don't usually think about are things like different types of archaeobacteria that, in fact, could be just as dangerous as some you know, humanoid or otherwise alien species. Um, because I had this concept in mind of what I wanted to do with my lesson and that I wanted to tie in with something NASA might already be doing, I didn't realize until I was way too far into it that I wasn't actually creating a lesson, I was creating a unit. So, um, just to kind of let you know my background, this is me, my full name, I'm the guy James Bothlaw III. Uh, I used to live in Austin, used to love to go out onto the lake. No, I don't fish, I don't know how to. My daughter knows how to fish, and so if I'm hungry, she does it for me because it seems like she throws anything out in the water and two minutes later she's got something on the hook. Uh, but I do love to go out onto the lake, and so uh, I was, I am at the high school. These are the classes that I have taught currently. I am the instructional coach for the high school, and I'll begin that job full-time this year, hopefully. Um, the researcher that I collaborated with was Elio, and of course, he's doing all sorts of really cool things with computing, so simulations and whatnot, and he actually has been developing a simulator that I'm going to be using in this particular lesson. Uh, I don't know that it's ready. We may want to play with it some more before we actually use it. But nevertheless, um, I took this concept of... Aliens have taken over, actually. <laughs> okay, there you go. Uh, I came up with this concept of how do you model a situation wherein... And there's several ways that this could go. We could go over there and bring back some microbe that just so happens to exchange a little bit of genetic material with something that we normally have, like E. coli bacteria, and suddenly it's developed these weird ways of doing things that are very harmful to us. That's one way. We might actually get some sort of a disease or infection from some, you know, genetically modified, unintentionally genetically modified bacterium. Let me just go here to the lesson overview, which is what that's about. Um, and so we might get sick and die. So, of course, one of the things that I, I bring up in my lesson is I do discuss, you know, how is the spread of disease controlled? And I use some pretty simple simulations in order to kind of look at different ways in which uh, diseases can spread. Um, but the other thing that I started to consider is that if you look at uh, this thing called vertical gene transfer, it's the fancy word to say we transfer genes from parent to offspring. Well, what we don't usually consider is the combination of horizontal and vertical gene transfer. There is, in fact, specifically with viruses, but some bacteria have been known to kind of throw some stuff out there at us. Uh, but specifically with viruses, we have, you know, a virus that infects a cell, and it goes through the lysogenic cycle instead of the lytic cycle. So instead of causing you to get sick, your cells explode, and all of these other virion particles go out and infect other cells. 
Uh, instead, we can actually have that viral DNA insert into our chromosomes, and then we carry it in our cells. Every time our cells replicate, we're actually copying that piece of viral DNA. And so there's actually the suspicion that there may be up to an eighth of our DNA that we actually carry in all of our cells that are reminiscent or leftover pieces of viral DNA that we just don't use. Of course, the trick is they can always become activated. And when they become activated, we can, in fact, you know, see these new types of things popping up, diseases and whatnot. And so what I wanted to do was to try to model that situation where not only could we just get sick, because that's what I want the kids to think about, is not us just getting sick, but also us carrying something that maybe on the surface we're not thinking about it. Oh, it's just another piece of junk DNA. It's not something that's going to bother us. But maybe five years, 10 years, 20 years, maybe even 20 or 30 generations down the road develops into something very bad and ends up wiping out our population. So I wanted to look at a way in how we could model that process of you know, carrying something with us that may or may not actually be damaging to us. And so kind of the thing that I came up with is if you think about the inheritance of genetic diseases, so something like breast cancer, for instance, which was already something I've already done in my classroom, a, a simulator looking at breast cancer. Um, perturbations to those genes can lead to you know, a heightened risk, but not necessarily, okay, you've got this thing, you've got breast cancer. It's, you know, considering environmental factors, you could get it, you could not. And so we based the simulation on something like breast cancer, where there is, you know, some perturbations to the system that could lead to a disease state, but also there's always that possibility that if you eat well and you have regular mammograms and that kind of thing, you don't get, you know, you don't have the condition pop up. And so that was the basic simulation that it came up with, and it's based on this concept that not everybody's going to be exposed to this particular piece of, you know, alien DNA. Maybe the astronaut has it, he comes down, he talks to his wife, he passes it on to her. They have some kids, they pass it on to their kids. So some, some will get it, others won't even be affected by it. Some may get it and it's going to affect right away and somehow they're going to turn, off, you know, they're going to turn on those genes, they're going to get sick and they're going to die. And so we looked at it in terms of how do you model something that we know to something we have no idea about. And so that was the simulator that he, uh, he created for us uh, in order to look at that. Um, but there's a lot of stuff here. Um, this, is, this is, like I said, it's a lesson unit. It's not a lesson plan. Uh, so there's a whole lot of stuff in here. And the big idea that I had was we teach a lot of the molecular genetics, the Mendelian genetics, uh, the basics of metabolism, the basics of you know DNA replication, transcription, translation, all of that kind of stuff we teach before before Christmas, typically. So that when we come back from Christmas, now we've got to reboot them after they've been gone for two weeks on the toughest <laughs> material that we teach in biology, and now we've got to tie it into, okay, now let's start talking about the six kingdoms. So can we, you know, what happens with eubacteria and archaeobacteria and all those kinds of things? And then let's start looking at their specific characteristics and how do they interact with one another. And so I looked at this as a means to kind of get them engaged because now they're trying to solve a problem. The problem being, what are the things that can happen if we end up on Mars and we encounter something that we you know, bring back and causes a problem? What are those ways that we can prevent that from happening? And what do we do if we can't prevent it and it's already here in our front, lo in our front door? So there's a lot going on. You know, you've got to know about your microorganisms, bacteria, viruses, different structural biochemical components. You know, looking at different types of, uh, of uh, sexual and asexual rep uh, reproduction. You know, you have to look at environmental conditions because one of the things I ask them in my lesson is, or my unit, is I say, okay, what is the Martian environment like? Is it like what we have here? Are we likely to find the same types of fauna and flora there that we would find here? And of course, we know some of the answers to these things, you know, methane-rich environments. So the likelihood is we're going to find different types of archaeobacteria on the planet, if at all. Uh, but they also had to understand things like, you know, how mutations transfer, how are they created, what kinds of things can happen as they, you know, progress through, through a, a series of different um, generations. Natural selection, you know, mechanisms by which disease is transferred. And of course, using modeling and simulation to try to explore these different situations. You know, things that they might think of, what's happening short term, what's happening long term, how can we kind of test, you know, some hypotheses about what we can do to try to prevent this. So, this is a grade 9 through 12 uh, lesson. 
Typically, this was something I, I might teach in a biology classroom. Of course, as I've mentioned before, this could be something that uh, you co-teach with uh, a junior teacher who's trying to get their kids ready for tax test. We always have kind of this, this pause before the test where everybody kind of says, okay, well, what, what we can do to kind of bring everything together to make it real for these kids so that when they go in and take the test, they just knock it out of the park. That was more kind of my idea here with adding that 11th, tw uh, 12th grade because typically biology is a 9th or a 10th grade class. Uh, here are all of these student prerequisites. So there's a lot of stuff that they have to know, but this is all stuff that we've taught them you know, up until this point before they've even stepped one foot in the class. So it's not like they're completely you know, unaware of this information. But I mean, look at some of this stuff. It's hard, okay? These kids are gonna have difficulty trying to tie all these things together. So I do try to take it a piece at a time uh, and, and make it so that they can kind of work stepwise with it. All right, so the objectives that I have for my students, you know, predicting basic characteristics of some no novel organism, something that they might find on Mars, for instance. Uh, identify possible ecological and or molecular biochemical genetic interactions between, you know, our, our own native bacteria and say something that we might find over there. Evaluate the possible short-term, long-term effects of these interactions and predict possible outcomes. So my procedure begins, uh, first of all, with a little reading activity. I think it's always good if you can kind of get kids reading, get them writing. And so I um, went to the AVID conference with Sheila, and so she knows what I'm talking about. These different vocabulary building activities that we can use, you know, keying, on, keying in on specific terms and a pretty complex piece of literature and having them kind of work through and process as groups or whatnot the types of things that, well, what does that word mean? And based on the context, you know, what do we think it means? And then, okay, let's develop our own type of definition of what it means, and then let's check it against what the real thing is. So there'd be a vocabulary building activity, and then they would, you know, take a reading, break it up into different pieces, what we call jigsawing, and they would actually look at this article called Benefits and Risk of Genetic Engineering. And the reason I do this is because it ties into what is potentially happening you know, when we interact with some sort of, you know, alien um, microbe, is this idea of we're actually changing our genetic material. And so I get them kind of engaged in thinking about, okay, what's the good thing about what we do now? You know, we have these genetically modified crops that we, you know, we want cotton that grows, you know, more little balls and so we can have more cotton. And we have, you know, uh, different drought resistant crops that we want to have in areas like Texas where we don't have a whole lot of rain all of the time. Um, how can we extend this type of thing to not just crops, but then we're looking at animal life and whatnot. And so I get them to start thinking about this and then throw them right into a Socratic seminar. So they're actually kind of battling back and forth and thinking about, well, do I think this is good? Do I think this is bad? Well, if this is bad, why? If this is good, why? You know. Uh, so get them to start thinking and maybe even start taking some sides. Day three. We discuss the engineering process, the problem solving applications. I show them some examples. And because mine is a unit, not a lesson, there's a whole lot that's not in here. So I do apologize for that at the, at the very onset. Um, I haven't exactly worked out you know, some examples, but uh, I'm sure I'll come up with something. Day four, I actually have them look at uh, one of three different video clips. And I kind of like this one, so I went ahead and, and made it a hyperlink so that we could look at it but it's to get them to start thinking about what is life like on other worlds. So let's see if this will work. Oh, I forget. Mm -hmm. Smart board's not connected to my computer. <coughs> so this is from NASA's Eclipse site. Let me just scroll down. Oh, no, that's not the wrong one. Oh, sorry.
Didn't you we take pictures when we were in Kingsville uh, on the tour on the base? Besides no. the Joe. <coughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune have surfaces made of gases and are found behind the asteroid. But is that all there is? Let's check with Alan Taylor, an amateur astronomer, and see what he's got to say. They have two videos simultaneously running. Uh, levels of well, hey, they're really fun. Do you ever wonder if life exists on other planets? planets? I mean, after all, your surface is covered with light from people, to animals, and even the plants. Well, it's not really a question of life exists. It's a question of whether life exists. Well, from people to animals to plants to bacteria that are so small we can't even see them. But what about other worlds like Mars? Does life exist there, or did it exist in the past? Today we're going to explore the possibility that life exists on other worlds, but not in the form of little green men we call aliens that you often see in movies. Have you heard of the term extraterrestrial? So that term just we're means coming time, from some place uh, other than Earth. That I do need so to when show, we talk about extraterrestrial clearly life, you can see we're talking the about the potential life on other worlds. That it gives them a primer, but what would those life forms look like? What is they life like us? Likely to be or like, would they look what different? might we see? So and I where think you get the look point. To find life outside our world? Water isn't. So give them the clip, uh, and of course it would be at this point that we would introduce the actual problem. How do we ensure that in exploring our solar system we neither accidentally harm ourselves nor accidentally wipe out a native species? So this would be something that as an individual they kind of start brainstorming, thinking about what they would do. Then they would get into groups and start thinking about our issues versus their issues. So kind of you know, conceptualizing what kind of things, if I was living on Mars, would I be concerned about? What kind of things living on planet Earth and going to Mars would I think about? Day five, <coughs> we would do a review of the molecular and Mendelian genetics me <coughs> mechanisms. Uh, we would do this in pairs, and then of course, that would have them individually create scale models of DNA, RNA, and proteins, and this is kind of an example of one of those scale models. And the idea is for them to understand how the pieces fit together, what the shapes look like, that kind of thing. So that when, you, when we go in and start modeling the process of mutation in these different molecules, as would occur if we have some piece of foreign DNA uh, inserted into our own genome, how that might look and how that might change the way that things look. So we, we have them model it out. And then day six, we come in and we actually use a simulator that I've used before. And it shows them, not in real time, but in, in a time frame that they would recognize and understand, how we actually go from DNA to RNA to protein. And I'll just show you that to you real quick. Or not. Okay, so it's a Java applet, and it's really kind of cool. Um, the way that it works is you can you can actually give the kids you know a piece of DNA, a series of nucleotides A T G C. And next, next, next. A lot of this is kind of intro stuff, and I like it because it gives the kids some background to read in case they've forgotten anything. Uh, but they can actually, you know, this is the actual simulator. And so what they can do is uh, they can come in here, and they, it already comes with a piece of DNA that you can go in and you can actually change what the sequence looks like. Uh, it doesn't have to be this short, which is I think about 25 or 30 nucleotides. You can actually do several hundred. Uh, but this just kind of shows you the basics. And you can go through the process of, you know, transcribing it. It shows you what happens when you make a copy of your DNA. And then, of course, you then click the next button, and it will actually translate the protein for you. And see how it's slowly going three letters at a time. So it brings in some of those same concepts of understanding how the genetic code is read. And it tells you which amino acids are shown, and then it actually folds the protein for you the way that it might look, you know, in nature. And so you can see the hydrophobic groups are all kind of sticking together. The hydrophilic groups are kind of sticking together. 
uh, because based on their chemistry they either want to be near water or they don't want to be near water and so they kind of you know tend to bunch up kind of like oil droplets would bunch up in water and so you can take a picture of this you can make different changes to the DNA you can then make new proteins compare picture to picture and kind of see where things are going and how these things have changed uh, and so of course this is one way for the kids to visualize oh so if I change this one thing it does this thing well, what if I introduce a big chunk of DNA like we might if we have some sort of uh, form of horizontal gene transfer? They can see how that protein has changed, and in some cases, you end up with a malfunctioning protein that's going to lead to disease. So that's this particular simulation. And again, the purpose of that was just to kind of get them to think about concepts they've already covered, a little bit more of a hands-on type to a little bit of the um, technical side of it. Day eight, we would then transition to reviews of fitness and natural selection. And the reason for this is to kind of understand how you know, these types of things may stay in the population or actually be ejected from the population if they end up being you know, detrimental to us. And so there is another simulator that I've used before, I used it last year with my students, that deals with natural selection and you can actually introduce mutations into a population, run the simulation and see what your population looks like after 10, 15, 20, uh, 20 generations. And so this one's kind of uh, more for the purposes of looking at the big ideas, helping them remember what is fitness, what is natural selection, how does the process work, the fact that it is not, in fact, geared towards finding the best answer. It's just, okay, this is what we have, let's work with what we have, and we end up with whatever works best. Kind of along the same lines with engineering. We kind of you know, diagnose a problem, come up with a solution, work through the problem, uh, work through the problem with the solution, we find good, we find bad, revise, and keep going. Day nine, uh, I was actually going to have them try to tie some of these things together. So I was going to have them complete a writing assignment with a what if type of scenario, and that would be about four or five different scenarios. What if, you know, the Mars, uh, the Martian uh, astronauts brought back some sort of a bacterium and it ended up affecting 10% of the population? What are we going to do if that happens? And so the kids kind of get to generate their own story of what they think is going to happen. And hopefully they don't do the whole, astronaut shows up and everybody dies. <laughs> we'll see. Hopefully they get some creativity and start thinking about, oh, well, people start growing a third arm or something, something that's, you know, going to be uh, exciting. And, you know, of course, have them draw, draw a book cover, come up with a neat title, make it a whole kind of process. But nothing too big. Day 10, we would then actually use the simulator that Delio came up with to look at some of these different scenarios where we have maybe this happens, maybe this happens, maybe this happens, run through the simulation and look at what happens to the population over time if we in fact have this little piece of DNA that's transmitted into the population and either continues to grow or kills everybody and then we don't need to worry about it anymore. Day 11, I come back to, again, vocabulary building going back into you know, reading activities, this time looking at the pros and cons of vaccinating children. And the reason I bring this up is even though it seems like it's kind of out of left field, one of the methods by which we, we may be looking at in order to prevent some of these things that we may not want you know, to happen might be saying, well, we're going to give you this experimental vaccination that's going to make sure that if any of those Martian microbes come back, you're not going to get sick. And so there's a couple articles that I have them look over, again, first in pairs, then in groups, kind of tear it apart. And again, day 12 Socratic seminar, have them kind of back and forth with one another. Is this a good idea? Is it a bad idea? And it allows them to kind of start thinking through, not just, okay, I have a problem that I'm going to solve and it's just about solving the problem. It's about thinking about those other things, the emotional aspects, you know, the social aspects, political, those types of things that always go into any decision that engineers are having to make. And then, of course, you know, from there we, we, we're continuing to, you know, move through the process trying to figure out exactly what's happening, tying in all of these pieces together, looking at you know, the spread of disease, and I think I am really short, so I'm going to just skip through this one. Uh, but this one looks at, uh, it models the spread of disease, whether it's foodborne, airborne, or person-to-person -person contact. And so, of course, I know that each of those different methods of disease spread are going to have a different rate of, of spread, and so I can actually use this as a means to model what I expect to happen if, say, someone were to... Uh, go into a large metropolitan area and is very, you know, charismatic and meets with a lot of people, that disease will spread a lot faster as opposed to someone that maybe, you know, is infected in the middle of nowhere. 
So we can kind of model those types of things, and, and all of that will be built into the lesson as I get all of those worksheets completed. Days 14 and 15, the kids actually work, uh, sit down and start working through what are the recommendations? How are they going to solve this problem? What are the things that they want to do for prevention? You know, for uh, dealing with something already being introduced into our ecosystem or whatnot. Days 16 and 17, they work on the presentations. 18 and 19, they'll actually present to one another. And like we are doing, they will have peer evaluations of one another. Okay? So, uh, these are the resources that, uh, these are the links that go to all of the, uh, the different uh, simulators that I used. I believe, did you put this in the uh, net logo, the simulator that you created? Is it, did you put it in the, in the library? Okay. Okay, but it does provide you with the ability to create your own simulations. And from what I saw with him, the, the language seems pretty easy to understand. And, and the programming doesn't seem like it's all that difficult once you get a handle on it. Uh, and of course, additional things, you know, the NASA website to look at, you know, <clears throat> what are they doing, what are, are some of the cool things that are going on there. Uh, an online textbook, so the students have an issue with, well, I don't really remember that, they can just go to that online textbook, review that particular data. Uh, and it also has a student self-assessment, so if there's a particular area that they're confused <coughs> about, they can actually read through the material, do a mini, uh, mini activity, and then test themselves. And so what are the next steps? Again, the lesson's going to be used after the Christmas break to kind of tie in the content from before the break to the content following. Uh, also, like I said, used to reteach concepts for juniors and seniors needing to pass the tax test. And then of course, you know, how do you integrate this into your everyday you know, life? How do you have other people's kind of buy in? And thank you, Renee, for giving me the idea. You just co-teach the lesson with somebody else. They see how the, the kids are actively engaged. They see how the kids are really learning. Uh, and so you build the enthusiasm, you build the buy-in, and then they want to do it as well. Okay? And that's my presentation. Any questions? That's why I got your back. That's why I got your back. <laughs>